Y'all ready for some cheap karaoke? <laughs> Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is David Collinsworth. I'm the General Manager CEO of the Brazos River Authority, and uh, I just want to take a few minutes to welcome you and thank everybody for coming. Uh, we, this is a meeting that we do annually if you've never been to it. Uh, you're gonna, for those of you that have joined us for our annual custom meetings in the past, you're going to meet some new people today, see some new presentations. Uh, I think you'll, some of the data that you're going to see is going to be quite interesting. As I was walking around and talking to a few of you, the, the, uh, uh, the theme of how does a drought end kept coming up. So that's what we say, how does a drought end? The answer to the question is in violent flooding. Uh, and some of the numbers that you're going to see over what we've received in rainfall over the last couple of months are, are pretty unbelievable. So uh, it, it really changed the, the tone of this meeting and how water's going to be managed and looked at going into this summer. So uh, it's a blessing in one way. It's been a challenge in another. Uh, and you know we still we still have some wet, some wet times ahead of us. I think so. Anyway, we're going to talk to you a little bit about a couple of our projects. We're going to talk to you a little bit about our uh, system rate and uh, some financial stuff going forward. You'll meet our new CFO, Michelle Jouaw. Uh, she's not new to the VRA. She's new to the role, but you'll get to hear from her a little bit. Uh, and then we'll uh, we'll have question and Q and A after every presenter, and then we'll uh, we'll have some lunch for you. Thank you. We're doing lunch. Doing lunch. Good. We're doing lunch. Okay. I see a lot of people shaking their heads, so maybe that, that's a good thing. Anyway, so uh, again, it's been a, a it's been a really unique four months. Uh, we were visiting with customers in other parts of the basin back in January and February about extreme drought and what this summer might look like if we didn't receive any rain, and we were having conversations. Of Pretty significant. So, all of those have been avoided, and we've, we've been managing some flooding issues. And uh, it, again, it's been a really unique uh, few months for us. So, uh, at this time, I'm going to invite Randall McCartney up. Randall, come on up. Randall's going to talk to you a little bit about Allen's Creek. Uh, Randall, uh, he might look tired. Y'all don't know him very well. I, I think he looks a little tired. Uh, but that's because he left Central Texas on Friday, drove all the way to Omaha, Nebraska, watched Texas A&M play, had a four-hour rain delay for the ball game, turned right back around and drove back in the next day. So uh, the diehard Aggie he wanted to be at the College World Series. So anyway, here's Randall. Randall's going to tell you a little bit about uh, Allen Creek. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. How are y'all? So as David said, I'm Randall McCartney. I'm the program manager for Allen Creek. Um, I've just transitioned into this role within the last six months or so. As part of that, I was the uh, reservoir manager at Boston Kingman Lake for the Brest River Authority. This is just going to be a very high level overview of Allen's Creek, kind of the location, and just a, a brief history of kind of where we are and how we got here. So, again, if, as you can see the little red depiction there, that's the proposed reservoir site just south of Sealy there in Wallace. Near the, near the town of Wallace in Austin County. Uh, the state water right was issued to Houston Lighting and Power back in 1974. Uh, the property was purchased and uh, however that project was never developed. So moving forward a little bit, in 2000, the Brez River Authority in the city of Houston purchased uh, the 9,500 acre site uh, from Reliant Energy, which used to be Houston Lighting and Power. And then the Brez River Authority purchased the full rights to the reservoir in May of 2022 from the city of Houston and the Texas Water Development Board. Currently, kind of gets you up to speed with where we are today. Currently working through the process to request an extension to the construction start date uh, that was specified in the water rights permit. And so once we took over the ownership in 2022, that kind of put us behind the eight ball a little bit. So we're proposing a new construction start date of no later than 2035. Uh, preliminary uh, environmental work that's currently underway, we've got some internal and external work that's going on. So with that being said, the internal, we've got our environmental folks that are doing some streamlined uh, uh, stream studies and whatnot there on the property, as well as we've hired an outside firm to come in and do some of the, uh, the 
environmental assessment, just kind of give us a baseline of what we have and where we're at. Again, we've completed the solicitation process and selected a permitting and design uh, consultant. That firm is Corolla Engineers. Currently, we are negotiating uh, the scope and fee. We're trying to develop that currently. And then again, the, the project itself will be developed and conducted in phases. Uh, will be the permitting and design phase and followed up by the construction uh, phase. And the total time for permitting and design and construction, we're very hopeful it can be approximately 10 plus years. So that kind of puts us right around that 2035 mark-ish. So that's kind of a really quick update as to Allen's Creek, but I'll be more than happy to take any questions that, that you guys have. Any questions on Allen's Creek? It has actually started. We've had boots on the ground over the last few months doing some of the environmental work. Uh, we're perfecting some of the property stuff as we speak. We're negotiating contracts for the rest of the geotech, and uh, we're moving. Is there so, water for Houston, or what's the water for? The water's for, the water's for a lot of things. The water is for, uh, for folks downstream of Allen's Creek. Instead of releasing water out of Possum Kingdom and Granberry and Whitney and Limestone and other lakes, we'll replace it with that water. Go back to your map. It's an off-channel reservoir, so on, on times when we're releasing water out of other lakes, we'll scalp it off the brasses and store it into Allen's Creek. So theoretically, during the hot summers when it's time to release water, this will be the first uh, a water body that we'll release water out of. So it'll really be a, 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 a drought savior, if you will, for a lot of our reservoirs upstream and allow us to reallocate how we manage our water. So, you got to have three things in Texas to build a reservoir. You have to have the water right. We have the water right perfected. You have to have the property. We have about 99% of the property. And then you have to have a 404 permit through the federal government, through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And that's the, the multi-year process that we're starting now. Any other questions? That, the question was how many acres? It's uh, 10,000, roughly 10,000 surface acres, a little bit less than that of property that we own. And the footprint will probably be somewhere between 9,500 acres and 10,000 surface acres. And it, it'll yield, uh, we think it'll yield somewhere close to 100,000 acre, acre feet of water. So it'll be a lot of water. 100,000 100, acre feet of water, correct me if I'm wrong here, is about the amount of water that we released last summer out of our reservoirs, roughly. So we would have been going into this, to this flooding period with Belton, Steelhouse, and other reservoirs, Whitney, and Possum Kingdom with more water in it. So it would have, it'll, it'll be a, a wonderful tool for operations, and it'll generate some more water for sure. Good questions. Thank you, Randy. Yeah. Okay, our, can y'all hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay, I hate standing behind a mic. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Peyton Lisenby. How long have you been with us, Peyton? Three years. Three years. Hydrologist, uh, uh, he's helping us in so many different ways with different permits that we have and managing our reservoirs. And he's gonna tell you a little bit about uh, an initiative that's been going on for years that's really picked up a lot of momentum in the last few years at Lake Whitney. So, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, as introduced, my name is Peyton Lisenby, uh, Senior Water Resource Planner here at PRA. And uh, next four slides, at least, are going to be a bit of a presentation on our status, our progress, and our aims with regard to this reallocation feasibility work that's been going on at Lake Whitney. My role in this project is simply to manage BRA's role as the non-federal sponsor. So I want, to, I want to make the point clear that this is a, an Army Corps of Engineers project. They're the lead, BRA is the cheerleader, and we help to pay the bills. So we'll talk a bit more about that and how that works uh, in a second. First things first, um, we talk about reallocation and obviously implies there are existing allocations. Uh, Whitney, like most core reservoirs, multi-purpose reservoir. It has several existing allocations. See here, there's a significant amount of flood storage, uh, which we've been using for the past few months, above uh, 533. Um, the conservation pool uh, has a few different allocations built within it. So, hey, hey, can you hold the mic up a little yes. Sorry. Yes, sir. Um, conservation pool is a little over 600,000 acre feet. Within that conservation pool, are proportions or allocations built for water supply and 
for hydropower. Um, whether it's for hydropower head, so to hold the water up high enough to be usable, or for hydropower itself, the actual water that's released to generate power uh, through the turbines. So in this conservation pool, which is really what we're most interested in, we're looking at the feasibility of reallocating those proportions of water that are currently set aside for either water supply or hydropower. Of course, also looking at um, this boundary right here, if it's feasible to um, allocate additional flood pool storage. Um, and so it's currently in the conservation source, so between 533 and 448.8, about 10% of that total amount of water is water supply. The rest of it is there for generating hydropower. Again, whether that is for hydraulic head, simply to hold the water up high enough to where when it flows through the turbines it actually generates a meaningful amount of electricity, or for actual generation, the actual flow of the water through the turbines. So, BRA is the non-federal sponsor for the project, the Corps of Engineers is the one leading the study, and the hydropower allocations is ma are managed by uh, SWAPA, the Southwestern Power Administration. So these are the allocations we're looking at the feasibility of uh, rearranging. So we want to determine what is the most efficient, what's the most effective solution for addressing substantial water supply needs in the ground surface. All right, Whitney is uniquely well positioned to play a significant role in addressing future water demand and water needs in the Brazos Basin. Uh, it's located high enough up in the basin where it can be utilized to supply a lot of needs downstream. Um, the big one is it's already there. You don't have to build the new reservoir, right? We just heard about what it takes to build the new reservoir, but these already existing, right? Which is really a lot of the benefit of a reallocation, looking at taking advantage of water that's already there. With reallocation feasibility studies, there are usually, and in this case that is true, several scenarios of reallocation that are possible that need to be evaluated. That's really the bulk of what the Corps of Engineers analysis is going to focus on. What different flavors of reallocation are possible? Whether it's just in the conservation pool, whether it's conservation in the flood pool, whether it's combinations of different types. And so there will be different volumes of water associated with different types of reallocation scenarios. Right? These are called alternatives. All the different ways you can reallocate a reservoir are labeled different alternatives. Each of those has a different volume of water associated with it and different amount of cost, whether it's monetary costs or exchanges or impacts to other uses of the reservoir. So the overarching goal here, um, what you know, BRA is serving as a cheerleader for what the Army Corps of Engineers is working towards, is identifying what's the most feasible approach. Not just what yields the most water, but also what yields the most water in the best way for everybody. Um, so that we can leverage our existing storage meet water supply needs in a really kind of economical and efficient way. So, the feasibility study began officially uh, last year in the spring. Uh, BRA has signed a cost-sharing agreement with the Corps of Engineers, uh, and that's what actually FCSA feasibility cost-sharing agreement, that's what kicked off the study. Since then, uh, BRA and the Corps have been working together at a lot of meetings and determining the pre-planning efforts, establishing those alternatives I just mentioned. What are all the different ways you can reallocate a reservoir? Right? We need to get those labeled, and we need to lay some ground rules about how we're going to evaluate them. Uh, that all culminates in what's called an AMM, uh, an alternative milestone meeting. There are a few members of the Corps of Engineers here. If you need an acronym guide, I'll be happy to help you out. Um, so we had that meeting by summer and established this array of different alternatives that, um, that are possible. Fall of last year, um, this project received its kind of approval from the vertical team, uh, which means locally we're working with the Fort Worth District, right? The cookies in that in that area. Above Fort Worth District Southwestern Division, and then of course headquarters. So this study, the results of this study, have to be evaluated and blessed, if you will, at different levels of approval within the Army Corps of Engineers. That's the vertical team, right? From the, from the district all the way through headquarters. So, a VTAM, vertical team alignment memo, uh, we got passed last fall, and that essentially gave us the go ahead to start actually chugging away on these alternatives. Okay, that's what we're doing right now. We are developing models 
to evaluate the different reallocation alternatives that we established back at the AML. That's ongoing, uh, getting close. Uh, the modeling, uh, model development is almost complete. We're amalgamating data sets from the URA, from the Southwest Power Administration, from the Corps of Engineers, uh, in order to feed this data into the model and evaluate the feasibility, the volumes, the cost, the risk associated with these different, uh, different alternatives. So, in terms of budget, all right, um, as I mentioned before, ERA is serving as a non-federal response. Uh, that's an important role. It means we're the ones that are going to try to make use, recognize the benefit of water that gets reallocated. It also commits us to splitting the cost of this study right down the middle. Uh, so the cost is about $3 million. Um, feasibility studies now are managed uh, according to what's called a three by three by three process, right? Three million dollar study, which should take no more than three years to complete, and it's evaluated at three different levels. I mentioned before, district, division, and headquarters. Three by three by three. So we're half of that first three. ERA contributes one and a half million dollars. We also aid in the development of the models. A lot of data about the ERA system, the ERA has, so we contribute that data to the Corps of Engineers uh, to help them develop the model. And so, officially, um, this process is, um, again, up to three years. So we're through the scoping phase, the alternative milestones, the AMM meeting we had last summer. We are currently in step two here, alternative evaluation and analysis. So the conclusion of this stage ends with what's called the TSP milestone. TSP stands for Tentatively Selected Plan. Once we develop the model, we start evaluating all the different alternatives. One of those alternatives is going to rise above the others. It's going to be the one that starts looking like, yeah, this might be the one that makes the most sense. That will be the two that we select in the plan. And that's the one that we pick apart a bit further, analyze a bit further, um, you know, narrowing down what costs are, what volumes are, and things like that. And then, we're going to, the big milestone meeting is the endorsement of whatever that alternative turns out to be. And of course, that goes through uh, review, how feasible that alternative is, and ultimately we're looking for what's called a change report, which actually presents the entire breadth of the study in a single report that shows the feasibility of that alternative, what's volume is, what's cost, or what's risk, risks, and things like that. I'm sorry, it just seems so invasive. Um, so again, we are about one year into this project. Uh, we're looking at wrapping up in the spring of 2026. We're currently evaluating the alternatives uh, as they sit. We have not yet reached a tentatively selected plan or a tentatively selected alternative, but that's what we're working towards right now. Okay. All right. That's a lot of information in a short amount of time. But does anybody have any questions? How many different alternatives are there? So um, it seems like this could be one by one by one. It's taking a long time, so maybe there's a lot more alternatives than I think. I don't really yeah, so it's important to, you cannot preemptively rule out alternatives without evidence. So your intuition is correct. There are a lot more than, than probably anybody might recognize. So at this point, there's about 12 to 15 different ways you, know, you can shake up the allocations at Lake Whitney to produce a different amount of water supply. Um, now, those aren't all carried through of those they're whittled down to one that makes the most sense. Yeah. Any other questions for Peggy? Okay, thank you, Peggy. I see some of you taking notes. Uh, if you'll give us a few days, all of these slides will be on our webpage, www.brazos.org. We'll also have a video recording of this meeting uh, on our webpage. So you'll be able to go back and look if you want. Our next presenter is uh, Aaron Abel. Aaron is our water services manager. <clears throat> Between Aaron and Peyton and the rest of Aaron's staff, very few people have worked more in the last two and a half to three months uh, because it's their department that monitors all the gauges and manages the reservoirs and costs for the releases. <clears throat> While you see online the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer reservoirs in flood stage, uh, that's because they have flood storage capabilities. Our reservoirs do not. 
So when our reservoirs are full, every drop of water that comes in has to equal just about a water, drop of water leaving the reservoir. Uh, so while you're laying in bed thinking, wow, this rain is really nice, it puts me to sleep, these guys are up all night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, making sure that uh, we're getting the right amount of volume released to protect uh, the river downstream, to protect the reservoir upstream. So anyway, Aaron's going to give you a, a presentation about what the last four months has looked like, the change, uh, and obviously the water supply uh, going forward. So Aaron? Thanks, Dave. You all hear me okay? Okay. Um, morning, everybody. Uh, so as David said, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what the last several months has been about. Um, everybody's you know, so, so thankful for the rain, but um, it has been a lot of work, and, you know, that's what we expect. You know, I mean, drought is a, you know, frequent Texas. Uh, you know, I think most folks realize that, uh, you know, there's some folks in the past that have said, well, Texas is a uh, land of perennial drought that is uh, broken by the occasional devastating drought. And, you know, we all kind of thought, well, you know, the last several years have been pretty tough in terms of uh, you know, drought, uh, especially in the Little River system. Um, but thankfully, the rains came, uh, came a little bit too much. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about how much rain we, we're talking about, and, and it's surprising, it really is. And you know, I know some of the uh, folks from the core are here, and um, it, it's it's a lot of work uh, you know, to make sure that these dams are safe and they do their job. And it takes a lot of monitoring, it takes a lot of manpower and people power. So, um, one thing I wanted to point out before we get started, um, Molly Moeller is the TCQ Brazos Water Master. She's in the back. And uh, just as a public service announcement, all y'all, as far as customers, are aware of the meters that, that you have to have uh, to divert the water, right? So whether you're lakeside or downstream uh, and you divert water, you have to make sure that your meter is certified by the water master prior to diverting. If you have, if you move a, a diversion location, you have to have the meter certified. So when in doubt, please call Molly um, and the water master program or call us and, you know, we can get you to Molly. Obviously, everybody kind of knows Molly. Anything else that Molly that I wanted to, uh, we wanted to make that that public service announcement. So, um, we'll just get right to it. So this, <laughs> this is our current reservoir status um, as of last uh, Wednesday. We're gonna have another one that, that comes out tomorrow. <coughs> and one thing that you'll see that has been different, um, especially if you look at this time last year, um, the white is the empty storage. You don't see much empty storage in these reservoirs. And so the, the, this is the perspective looking from about San Angelo across to, you know, Texarkana. So the far left is Potsdam Kingdom, far right, uh, Lake Somerville, and then you see the, the coast down here. Uh, the height of the, the columns are representative or proportional to the full capacity of the reservoirs. So, you know, Whitney obviously is the, the largest reservoir in the basin, Potsdam Kingdom. You see very little uh, empty storage, and so that's good. One thing I wanted to point out, so we have 11 reservoirs in the water supply system. Three are owned and operated by the Brazos River Authority, that's Possum King and Danbury and Lake Limestone. Since March 1st of this year, just in those three reservoirs, we've released over 1.1 million acre feet of water. So. Uh, right now, we're at 99% uh, full as far as all of the, the conservation pools combined over the 11 reservoirs. And that's about a little over 1.91 million acre feet. So there's about 360,000 acre feet of water that is stored in uh, or impounded in the flood control pools uh, of Whitney, Aquila, Belton, Stillhouse Hollow, Granger. And, and Somerville. Most of that is, is within Belton uh, right now. Um, 
changes in our drought contingency declarations. We have had um, a lot of changes, and you'll see right here, we still show Proctor at stage four, but that was rescinded uh, late last week. So the, the version of this uh, graphic that will come out tomorrow will show Lake Proctor at stage one. Uh, so in the upper right, you'll see the uh, percent full and uh, the two-week percent change uh, in each of the res reservoirs, uh, the current drawdown and the two-week change in drawdown. So you know, a lot of the, the core reservoirs are actively uh, evacuating their, their flood control uh, pools, and they've been doing that over the last couple of months when uh, conditions allow, and it, I think it's probably gonna take uh, another several weeks, you know, well into July before uh, those levels get down to the top of conservation. So we're well, prepared for anything the rest of the summer brings. It's, it's nice to have uh, reservoirs that are, that are full, obviously. Let's see. So the rain. So what, what have we experienced uh, you know, since the start of the year? So this is the year-to-date observed precipitation. So since January 1st, 2024 uh, to, to uh, June 12th of 2024. And this is the rainfall, observed rainfall um, across the basin, and, well, across Texas, but the basin is outlined, you can kind of see it, and then all the, the reservoirs are located uh, and labeled. And what you'll see, you know, does, does anybody recall about what, how much rain you get in your location over a year? A lot of folks, you know, get maybe 30 to, you know, 40 inches down in the, in the lower basin, maybe 55 inches or so. Well. In parts of Limestone and, and Falls County, uh, just since, really just in the, in the last several months, they've received 40 to 50 inches of rain. So that's, you know, we, they saw um, about the same amount of rain that they were getting the whole year in, in a month or so. And that created um, a new flood of record at Lake Limestone. So that was one of the things that was significant about um, April and the May and, and how wet it was is um, the night of May 1st and the, the morning of May 2nd, we had inflows approaching 100,000 CFS into Lake Limestone. So that necessitated uh, releases out of Lake Limestone approaching 78,000 CFS. So that was about 20,000 cubic feet per second above our previous flood record, which was in May of, of 2009. So we got a lot of rain in a short uh, amount of time. Uh, you know, thankfully, everything uh, infrastructure-wise is, is doing what it's supposed to do and designed, and you know, we continue to, to store water. Um, other parts of the basin, you know, in the lower basin, you, you can see 25 to 30 inches already. Um, and then even upstream of the Council <coughs> Kingdom, we saw 25 to 30 inches, um, you know, since uh, January 1st. And a lot of that fell, you know, really uh, since March 1st, and in some areas, really April to so how does that translate into a percent of normal precipitation? So you can view this as um, the amount of rain above normal uh, compared to you know, what, what typically falls between January 1st and, and June 12th. So you can see the, the, these dark blues here. Um, that's 200 to 300 percent um, you know, greater than normal. So you know, at, around Lake Limestone and upstream, they receive two to three times the amount of rain that they would typically see over this, the first six months in, in the year. So also, that, that's kind of the same story uh, upstream of Possum Kingdom. We've continued to have releases out of Possum Kingdom um, that's kept uh, Granberry full and then you know, kept, kept Whitney full as well. Um, and other parts of the basin, you know, you're seeing 150 to 200 percent, so one and a half to two times uh, the normal rainfall you see over this period. So, you know, a lot of rain, um, you know, it's probably the, the wettest spring that we've seen probably since uh, May, you know, the spring of 2015. So what, what do we see in the future? And this is, you know, these are seasonal precipitation outlooks uh, disseminated by the National Weather Service and, and NOAA. These are, these are released um, every third Thursday. So we'll, we'll see another, uh, release of these um, coming up this Thursday, but each one of these graphics 
uh, depicts a three month period. So this first one in the top left, July, August, September. Uh, the next one is August, September, October, etc. And so the, the color regions here, so the, the greens are the probability or percent chance of above normal precipitation in those three months. And then the tans and the browns are um, the percent probability of, of leaning below normal precipitation. So basically, tan, dry, green, wet. Um, so what you'll see here uh, as we progress through time is, you know, this summer, uh, the rest of this month, we'll, we're probably still, still going to see some, uh, some rainfall, uh, especially with the tropics, pretty active. Um, but as we march through, you know, into the fall, they are leaning towards drier than normal. And that has to do with uh, the El Nino La Nina cycle. We've transitioned away from La Nina, we're in neutral conditions, and there's a probability of um, entering into La Nina again. And as most of y'all know, La Nina tends to cause the jet stream in the storm track to, instead of being you know, in the southern tier of the US, it, 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 it tends to be you know, higher in the latitude. And that's why you'll see these greens up in the northwest and in the northern tier of the US. And so that's, that's what's baked into these uh, precipitation outlooks is this transition into La Nina. So, you know, that's something to watch out for. And I won't say that it's definitely we're, we're going to see a drought again uh, because we have continued to see, you know, flood events even during La Nina cycles. So, you know, that, that's something to look out for. Um, so, you know, obviously conservation is important. Um, you know, all the time, um, but you know, we're in Texas. We're gonna we're gonna transition into drought at some point, uh, but we're thankful to have have the the supply right now. So I think that's that's all we have in water supply. Any questions for Aaron? So Aaron, I think it's safe to say we're good for summer. We're good for summer. Oh, and one other thing. Y'all probably saw this, but this is our annual customer water use and a reservoir accounting summary. Uh, this is available on our website. Um, if you just Google Res River Authority and customer water use reservoir County, you can find that PDF, but we also have that the use of hard copy. It's an excellent source of information. So uh, a couple of things. First of all, after Michelle presents, we're gonna have lunch. Uh, there's quite a few DRA folks here, so if you'd rather have some offline conversations about questions over our budget stuff or water, we'll, we're going to hang around and, and allow you to do that. Uh, come on up, Michelle. Michelle Gerois is our new CFO, David Thompson, uh, retired. He bought him an RV, uh, so he is uh, soon to leave on his way toward the Seattle area where he's got grandkids and, and those type things. Michelle has been with us for 23 years. Uh, she's been budget manager uh, for a lot of our contract operations. People have known Michelle for many years. She is uh, really, uh, uh, it was once said, she has a PhD in, in Brazos River Authority Finance. Uh, so she really understands uh, where we are and where we're going. Uh, we have a lot to do. And a lot of you, we also talked early about, before the meeting, about growth and the growth that's happening all over Texas. Coming out of the Houston metro area, the entire I-35, coming out of Fort Worth, we have three of the busiest areas in Texas that are dealing with growth. Growth brings challenges, we need new water, we've got to, we've got to develop new water supply. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about our reservoirs, and our newest reservoir is 50 years old. So we have a lot of infrastructure, Possum Kingdom Reservoirs, it's, it's a whole lot closer uh, to 100 years old than it is to uh, 50 years old. So we have a lot of money to spend uh, in the next 10 years to both make sure that we can uh, store water in those reservoirs, release water in those reservoirs, uh, begin to work on new water supplies throughout different parts of the basin and projects that we have. Years ago, we were talking about it being hundreds of millions. Now we're talking about it being billions of dollars. So inflation is impacting us just like it's impacting all of you. 
good news and bad news. The good news is we have some money. We're in a really good financial position. Uh, the bad news, if you want to take it this way, is that our water rates are very, very low. And our water rates don't support billions of dollars worth of projects. So as the next 10 years moves forward, we have to increase our water rates to be able to pay for billions of dollars worth of infrastructure work and new water projects. So Michelle's going to walk you through those numbers. Uh, the 10-year projection that we're showing is, is very similar to the 10-year projection that we've been showing uh, for the years in the past. Uh, we are aggressively scrubbing projects in-house. We are uh, developing and implementing risk management strategies so that we can better understand from a five-year and a 10-year and a 15-year perspective what we're going to have to do uh, at our dams. Uh, trying to eliminate any surprise that would impact our uh, system rate. Uh, and we're doing all that we can do uh, to control cost and, and make sure that we're being good stewards of, of the money, uh, the revenues that we make. For those of you that are new uh, to, the, to the River Authority world, uh, we're a governmental entity, uh, so we don't receive any appropriations from the state of Texas. All of our projects have to be paid for uh, by selling the water that the state of Texas has permitted to us. So we're a self-supported organization that does not receive tax dollars. We don't receive legislative appropriations. Uh, so when we when we talk about billions of dollars worth of projects, we have to be able to raise the revenue through our rates to go borrow the money uh, at uh, at the appropriate interest uh, rates uh, to, to to do our projects and impact our uh, our spending. So. Anyway, uh, I'm really excited for you to, to hear Michelle and get to meet her after the meeting. She's been uh, uh, she's been so instrumental in, in the last 23 years of, of positioning the BRA to be where we are financially today. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so this is the the sleepy presentation right before lunch, so I'll try not to bore you guys too much. But basically, I'm going to kind of walk through a presentation that we uh, preliminary gave to our board back in May uh, for our fiscal year 2025 budget, and we're going to take it to our board for final approval in July. Um, so we're starting out with, I forget how to work this guy. Whoop. Okay. Move to... There we go. Okay. So we're going to mainly start out talking about what's happening next year, fiscal year 25, and some of the assumptions that we're looking at uh, when building our budget for next year. Um, our budget includes an employee cost index increase of 2.5%, um, and a merit pool of 3%. Um, unfortunately, after four years of our health insurance costs being pretty much steady, uh, we are looking at a pretty hefty increase in our health insurance premiums of 26% for next year. Um, we are including adding five full-time positions. Um, our professional service expenses, which is, uh, includes um, our share of the O&M expenses for our storage space in the Federal Reservoir Lakes, is going to go up by a million dollars. Um, we also have some professional services projects, our uh, water management plan for our system operations, our 10-year renewal for that is due. Um, we have some dam inspections uh, that happen every five years that are coming up next year. Uh, we also have some surveys, so our professional services are going to be increasing about $3.1 million. Also included in our operating budget are our operating projects. Um, these are multi-year projects. Um, they don't necessarily create an asset. They're mostly studies and assessments and um, smaller dollar repairs. Um, but they are funded with current revenues, and so they do affect our system rate. So these are the ones that are scheduled for fiscal year 25, and then we also went ahead and we're showing you what we have planned out for the next five years. <coughs> uh, 
On the other side of our expenses are our revenues. Um, so non-system water revenues, we're expecting uh, El Cerro water, the revenue from that is gonna increase uh, 460,000 uh, due to an increase in LCRA's rate that we're getting to pass on to those customers. Um, our ag rep water revenue is going to increase because it's tied to our system rate and we also have uh, some long-term CPI water that's converting to ag water. Other water supply revenues that are not tied to water sales are interest income with one upside of inflation is uh, we're going to see an increase in our interest income of about 1.8 million due to higher than anticipated cash balances and favorable interest rates. Um, we also have a water treatment plant at East Williamson County on Lake Granger. Uh, the revenues from that are expected to increase about two and a half million uh, due to higher water usage from our customers. And so with all that information together, we come out and we calculate our system water rate. Uh, we take our non-system water revenues, we net them against our expenses, which include our O&M expenses, our debt service, and our operating projects. And then we add in our coverage requirement on our debt. And then we add any contribution or utilization from our rate stabilization fund, and I'll talk about the rate stabilization fund a little more at the end, to come up with a total financial requirement. And we divide that by the number of system rate, system units, which are acre feet. And that's how we come up with our system rate. And so the rate for next year is going up 6.4% from 93.50 to 99.50, which if you were at the meeting last year, that's right in line with what we showed you last year, that the rate would be for fiscal year 25. This is just a graphic version, because I kind of like pictures, to show of your, your system rate, the, each acre foot, where it's going to, and you can see the big bulk of it is our ongoing operating and maintenance expenses. The debt service is staying pretty steady. Um, Operating projects are going up a little bit, coverage is staying the same, and then the increase to the, or the contribution to the rate stabilization fund. And so this, uh, this table, just to kind of give you an idea of how much water we have under contract and what kind of contracts. Um, and you see our system rate makes up the largest number of acre feet at 99.50. Then we have our agriculture water, which we sell at 70% of whatever the system rate is. We have some older two-tier and other fixed price, some electric utility, and then the Colorado Basin water, which is the LCRA. This is a graphic that shows what our contracts are going to do going into the future over time. And so we do our long range planning assuming that any water contracts that expire will be renewed at the system rate. And so you see right here we have some utility contracts that are gonna expire in 2030 and they renew as system rate contracts here. Uh, we have some where we see an increase in the total height of the bar. This is perhaps some Lake Whitney water coming in that we can sell. This is Allen's Creek. And this is way further down Lake Somerville. And so this is just an overall look at our budget for fiscal year 25. It includes our water supply system that we talked about. It also includes our cost reimbursable. And um, it really doesn't have an effect on our system rate except for the fact that we collect a management fee off of these water and wastewater plants that we operate. It helps offset the system rate. But we 
We're beginning the year with 105, or expect to begin the year with 105 million in reserves. We have our revenues and expenses uh, to create a margin of about 4.6 million. We plan to invest about 38 million of our reserves into capital improvement projects. Uh, we're not anticipating issuing any debt next year. And so we're looking at ending reserves of around $72 million at the end of fiscal year 25. And so now let me talk about what heck's going to happen this year, next year. We'll talk about all the projects and the things that we have coming up and the things that we have to consider when we're planning our rate. And so we have a long range financial plan and it's basically a model that we use to forecast um, where we're going to be based on our current conditions. And we use it to evaluate uh, proposed projects and their effect on future years. And so our, it's, uh, it's a 50 year model to align us with the state water plan. We only look at the water supply elements. We don't include any other cost reversible elements. The inputs, in, Inputs into the plan or into the model uh, are existing debt service schedules, the upcoming year proposed annual operating plan, our project inventory, our water contract inventory, and then we have um, inflators that we use to inflate all the expenses and revenues. And so some of these are some of the assumptions. Um, Expenses are estimated over the 50-year plan using the inflators. Uh, the inflators are um, applied to the proposed annual plan to forecast the future years. We reevaluate the inflators every five years to make sure they're predicting where we're actually ending up in the future and they're adjusted as needed. Um, expenses for new plan operations are layered into the model in the year following the completion of the project. For instance, Allen's Creek, the year after we're budgeting for completion of Allen's Creek, we have O&M expenses layered in for the operation of that. We also go in and make manual adjustments uh, for things we know are going to happen in the future. Our, uh, our defined benefit pension plan is going to be fully funded in about seven years, so we go into the model and we pull that expense out. And project expenditures are based on the updated project budget worksheets. And those are worksheets that all the project managers fill out for their projects and their annual spend that they anticipate having on each project. So this is a five-year look at our capital improvement project. So this is what we have planned for next year see the 43 million but then you can see in the next years how that goes up quite a bit as things like Allen's Creek, uh, Bell House Drop Preparedness and some of those other projects start kicking off. And so this is a graph of our capital projects by project type. So you can see what sort of functions we're going after. You can see uh, a lot of it is new infrastructure that has to do with um, uh, Bell House, we consider new infrastructure. Um, water distribution, uh, this is uh, work that's being done on Robinson County Raw Water Line. Uh, infrastructure maintenance, and then new water. And so all that new water, at least in the next five years, And so in order to do these projects, uh, after two fiscal year 25, we'll have to start issuing debt. And so this is just a graph of possible debt we'd be issuing each year. So once we have all that information in the model, um, 
we made assumptions about revenues and like I said, we said that all non-system contracts uh, will convert to system rate contracts when they expire. Um, ag rate contracts are considered to renew as ag rate contracts at 70% of whatever the anticipated system rate is. Revenue for new water created by projects is assumed to be sold at the system rate in the year following the completion of the project. So in uh, our model, the year after we finish the Lake Whitney reallocation, we have that water sold. And the same thing with Alice Creek and Somerville. So once all that information has been put into the model, and we go through the process of what we call balancing the model. And so we do that by adjusting the system rate or issuing new debt or utilizing our rate stabilization reserves to make sure that all the following financial stability tests are met. So we have a debt service coverage of at least 1.3. We have a 90-day working capital reserve. Uh, we have a contingency reserve fund that's currently set at 5.5 million, a self-insurance reserve fund that's currently set at 500,000, and also that our budget is balanced. And so after we run the model, these are our projected year-end reserve balances. I have it broken out by those tests that we just talked about. So this is our contingency reserve that we have to have, our self-insurance reserve. This is our 90-day working capital. I don't know if you can see in here too well, but over time, that as our expenses go up, that green bar creeps up a little bit. And then anything that left, is left over, those are our rate stabilization reserves. And so you see right now, we have very healthy rate stabilization reserve balance, but we're going to use a lot of that in the coming years to start building some of these capital projects. And so I told you I'd tell you about rate stabilization reserves and what we use them for. And basically, they sit out there and in these years, let's see if I can explain this better than I explained it in the last meeting, but this is how much of the rate stabilization fund we are going to use to help reduce the system rate by this much in future years. And so we use that so that we don't have large spikes in the rate, We're trying to keep things um, steady and a more predictable rate structure for you all. That's on slide everybody's been waiting for. So this is a 10-year projection of what our system rate is going to do. And so we're keeping everything under 7% but you can see steady increases over the next 10 years. And that is to pay for the billions of dollars of projects that David was talking about. So I realized that was a lot really fast. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. It's a consumer price index. It's one of our, it's an old contract, and so it uh, the rate increases every year based on the CPI index. What is two tier? Two two tier is almost the same thing as CPI water. It's it's an also an old contract. Um, all of our other contracts are take or pay. We pay for all the water. The two tier is we pay one rate for the water that you take and a different rate for the water that you have reserved. And those also um, increase on a, I think a, a CPI every year. The, those two tier contracts were, were a product of a rate case that happened uh, back in the 90s that established both how we were going forward with our system rate and uh, settle some disputes that we had with some other contracts. So it's a, it's a product that we don't offer. So we've given you a ton, whether it was for projects or water supply. Uh, BRA folks, raise your hands. There's a lot of BRA folks here 
uh, that are going to stick around and, and answer questions. If, if you want more information about the BRA, most of these projects that are listed here are on our webpage in a, a project area. All of the stuff that Aaron showed you uh, is updated uh, pretty frequently, and we put that uh, on, on, our, on our webpage. Uh, we also, uh, just FYI, when we, we were in the middle of the drought, we were going online every two weeks and putting a video out about drought, uh, drought conditions. Uh, Brad Burnett is here. He's the Central Lower Basin Regional Manager. Michelle is here. All the other staff. Uh, if if you need if you need more about BRA, why we're doing what we're doing, don't hesitate to reach out to us, and we'll come see you, and we can uh, give you more BRA 101, or we can drill down into the specific projects. Uh, there was a, nobody asked a question about the water snake project, so I won't talk about it, but you might be sitting and scratching your head on what in the world are they doing with water snakes? We're not killing them. Uh, so uh, anyway, so there's a lot there, and I realize the complexity of what we do is different than what we do. So uh, again, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us as a resource uh, so that we can, we can help you educate your entity on what it is we're doing or why you're paying what you're paying for water or where we're going in the future. Also here with the BRA, I want to introduce you to uh, uh, some of our, our board members. Uh, our tie to the governor's office is that the, our governor, uh, the governor of the state of Texas, appoints our board members. And we have 21, and we have a few that are here today. Board Taylor is here. Uh, Dr. Judy Crone is in the back. And Mr. Wayne Wilson is in the back also. So we, we really appreciate their support and them being here. Our board of directors meets every other month. And as Michelle said, uh, we will uh, we'll wrap this budget presentation up and take it to them. Uh, in the last Monday of July. You can watch that on YouTube. You can come to the board meetings. They're all open in public. Uh, in public <coughs> if you want. So, anyway, one last shot for questions. Okay, hearing none, what's the rules for lunch? Did anybody bring lunch? I think we have lunch or you can go play pickleball. Uh, they look like a pretty uh, 